Subcommittee will come to order. First, let me welcome our witnesses and thank them for their testimony today. Uh, we invited you because each of you represents a key stakeholder uh, group involved in our nation's rail industry. As you all know, Chairman Schuster, Schuster and I are committed to rail reauthorization this year. Uh, I state that at every hearing because I want everybody to know that it is coming very, very soon. And uh, we're going to need all of you uh, involved in helping to uh, get something that makes sense, especially in today's uh, fiscal challenges. We've, uh, we've traveled across the country now. We will continue to uh, visit different, different states in the nation, um, local and federal officials. And we're discussing uh, the last reauthorization bill and how it's affected the railroad industry. We've heard suggestions on how we can improve our laws so rail transport can expand in a safe and efficient manner. It's clear that the current rail authorization has helped improve passenger and freight rail service in this country. For example, PREA sections 209 and 212 have moved the ball forward with regard to Amtrak's state-supported routes and Northeast Corridor operations. These lines of business have increased revenue and eliminated much of the need for any federal operating subsidy. Our goal is to build on the PREA successes and tackle the challenges that remain for freight and passenger rail. Hopefully this hearing will inform the committee of uh, what steps need to be taken to reach that goal. As I stated earlier this year, we need to be pragmatic and transparent, and we'll need all parties to participate in order to deliver the best bipartisan product to the House floor. As seen by this week's House and Senate appropriation marks, we need to operate within realistic budget constraints, and I think we all agree reforms are necessary to ensure and leverage every dollar we do have efficiently. There's no division between the different services Amtrak provides. We need to put a structure in place to allow Congress's investment to strengthen passenger rail. We need to prioritize our investment. We need a reliable source of funding to invest in existing infrastructure in places like California, the Midwest, and the Northeast Corridor within existing resources. This means we might have to take a, a hard look at the pie-in-the-sky vision such as FRA's multi-billion dollar unrealistic budget. Uh, we should invest in projects that will increase safety, increase reliability, and reduce trip times without breaking the bank. Ideally, Prop 1A in California should be invested in realistic local projects instead of a project that has no realistic business plan, no proven ridership, and exploding costs. For instance, uh, in California, we've got the California State Rail Plan, which lists 27 capital investment projects for ACE. Uh, we have 36 for the San Joaquin Line and 42 for the Capital Corridor. Each will benefit existing ridership. Taxpayers entrust in this body their hard-earned dollars, and we must be sure th those dollars find their way back in the form of tangible benefits. Throughout my travels, I've heard from reoccurring questions that I want to address with uh, today's witnesses. Uh, how do we focus our limited resources on investments that make sense in places like my home state of California? How do we improve governance on the Northeast Corridor to ensure stakeholders have an equal seat at the decision-making table? How do we leverage private sector investment and innovative financing to enhance our ability to invest in infrastructure projects? These issues are just an example of the difficult task we must tackle together in the next few months. Again, I want to thank all of our witnesses this morning. I'd now like to recognize uh, the ranking member, Corinne Brown, from Florida for five minutes to make any opening statements she may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we meet this morning, the House Appropriation Committee is considering a bill that would cut funds for Amtrak 2014 provide just $950 million for the railroads, including $350 million for operational grants and $600 million for capital and debt service. Federal funds of $950 million will not give us a better railroad. We know this from experience. What it will do is put Amtrak workers out of jobs cancel replacement and overhaul of rail cars and locomotives, and derail service improvement we demand from Amtrak in the 208 bill. 
I think that if we are going to focus on national rail policy, we ought to be discussing the impact of constant cutting Federal support for Amtrak while demanding more and more reforms. The two issues go hand in hand. How can Amtrak improve long distance routes without funding? How can we expect Amtrak? track to reduce trip time when we fail to make the infrastructure investments that are needed to implement these reductions. Indeed, this committee on a bipartisan basis authorized a total of $9.8 billion for Amtrak in fiscal 2009 through 2013. However, annual appropriation for Amtrak since 2008 has been significantly lowered, about $2.5 billion less than what we authorized. Just take a look at this chart. Where is the chart? Now, five years later, some members claim that Amtrak have not done enough. Well, I truly believe you get what you pay for. Other countries have learned that a, a long time ago, China, Japan, France, and the UK are all investing billions in their passenger rail service. We constantly talk about wanting what they have when it comes to passenger rail, but then we are not willing to finance it. We look for other people to finance it. Other people who have time and again told this committee that the federal government needs to step up to the plate. We did this for highway and aviation. From 1947 to 1970, when Amtrak was created, the federal government spent $11.3 billion on aviation. At the same time, we spent $52.4 billion for the development of an interstate highway system. While most of the money came from user fees, at least $8 billion was from general fund. Today, annual federal spending on highway construction exceeds $42 billion. We have not spent that much on improving passenger rail in 43 years. We often gloss over the fact that funding does not come from user fees. In fact, since 2008, a total of $52.3 billion in general funds have been transferred to the Highway Trust Fund to keep it sovereign. I know that the chairman plans to hold hearing on financing, but again, I think we're going to talk about national rail policy. We need to also talk about the hole we are digging ourselves into by failing to adequately invest in Amtrak. Now let me briefly turn to long distance. There have been a lot of talk in the press about eliminating long distance routes. I strongly oppose that. These routes literally connect our east coast to our west coast. They is what make Amtrak a national railroad. Without the long distance train, over 4 million people in 23 states and 223 communities will lose all passenger rail service. Let me repeat that. 4 million people in 23 states and 223 communities will lose all passenger rail service. Finally, a critical component of our reauthorization bill includes reauthor reauthorizing our nation rail safety program. Although rail accidents are down, the National Transportation Safety Board have been called in to investigate 11 rail accidents that have occurred since June 2012. We must keep this in mind as we work on our bill to take advantage of the opportunities we have before us to eliminate what we need to do to make this a very safe industry even safer. With that, I want to thank all of our participants, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the panelists today. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank our witnesses today. Our panel will include uh, the Honorable Joseph Zabo, Administrator from the Federal Railroad Administration, Michael Melifi, <coughs> President and CEO of American Public Transportation Association, Ed Hamburger, President and CEO of the Association of American Railroads, Mike Lewis, Director of Rhode Island Department of Transportation on behalf of the American Association of State Highway uh, and Transportation Officials and Mr. John Tolman, Vice President and National Legislative Representative for the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. I ask unanimous consent that our witnesses' full statements be included in the record without objection so ordered. Since your testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee would request your oral testimony to be limited to five minutes. Mr. Zabo, you may proceed. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chairman Denham, Ranking Member Brown, and members of the subcommittee. Appreciate the opportunity to testify. The Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act and the Rail Safety Improvement Act, both passed in 2008, were bipartisan, game-changing pieces of legislation. 2012 was the safest year in railroading history. 
Amtrak's on-time performance, its ridership, and its revenues are now at all-time highs, and the freight rail industry has never been stronger. Today, 6,000 6, corridor miles are being improved, 40 stations are being upgraded, hundreds of new passenger cars and locomotives are being procured, and states are competing uh, are completing more than 100 different environmental, engineering, and planning projects. But we still have a long way to go to make up for decades of underinvestment in rail and be ready for the challenges ahead. Soon America's transportation network will need to move 100 million additional people and 4 billion more tons of freight annually, and it will need to do it safely, reliably, and efficiently. Our airports and highways are stretched to their limits, Congestion costs our economy more than $120 billion per year. Rail is the clear mode of opportunity. It's extremely safe, cost-effective, and the least oil-reliant, most environmentally friendly mode to move people and freight. Citizens are showing us the way. Recent studies by U.S. Perg and the Frontier Group have painted a clear picture of Americans' shifting travel habits. In 2011, the average American drove 6% fewer miles than in 2004. In just 10 years, Amtrak's ridership is up more than 40% and growing faster than any other mode of travel. Population growth, mobility challenges, shifting travel patterns, these are the reasons why it's essential for us to work together to provide rail with a sustained source of funding that will put it on par with other modes. The five-year, $40 billion rail reauthorization proposed in our fiscal year 2014 budget builds on the core principles of our previous authorizations. And we propose to fund our budget with a new rail account within the Transportation Trust Fund. Our vision is for a national high-performance rail system that builds on today's progress, enhancing the nation's rail system by addressing safety concerns, by providing funding for passenger and freight rail improvements, and by promoting strong planning. Our vision is a state of good repair for Amtrak, improving safety, efficiency, and reliability. With your support, we can develop new passenger rail services and substantially upgrade existing corridors. And we can fund freight rail projects critical to our nation's economic competitiveness, including ones to improve safety by eliminating or upgrading public highway rail grade crossings. We envision a world-leading domestic rail industry, and we will manage our investments through a transparent process. Four years ago, when we started our high-speed and inner-city passenger rail program, FRA evaluated nearly 500 applications submitted by 39 states, the District of Columbia, and Amtrak. The applications requested more than seven times the available funding, illustrating the enormous pent-up demand. And in the past four years, the pipeline of rail projects has only grown stronger. Making large-scale investments on a year-to-year -year basis is both difficult and inefficient. No rail system in the world has ever been successfully planned and developed in this fashion. Funding predictability is a necessity to empower our partners, the states, local governments, and the private sector so they can plan for and invest in the rail network our economy needs and our people deserve. So now is the time for a new bipartisan, game-changing vision for American Rail, and we look forward to working with you to make it happen. Thank you very much. Mr. Melanifee. Good morning, Chairman Denham, Congresswoman Brown, members of the subcommittee. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify on our priorities for rail policy in this country. APTA believes that the nation needs an integrated network of passenger rail services, including high-speed rail where appropriate, that connects with the existing Amtrak system and with commuter rail, transit operations, and other intermodal connections. Travelers should be able to make seamless connections between modes, between major metropolitan regions linked by rail service. As the nation's population swells by nearly 150 million people by 2050, we need to make investments in our transportation infrastructure including inner-city passenger rail, which provides transportation choices and achieves national goals. We support dedicated revenues for such a program, other than those currently supporting the Highway Trust Fund. 
We also support a streamlined NEPA review process for projects. Moreover, both private and public sector participation should be considered in the development of new rail service and the planning, construction and financing of new rail infrastructure. We recognize the current fiscal pressures that the Nation faces and the challenges for Congress in providing fiscal resources and setting priorities within the Federal budget. However, we believe the investments in infrastructure, including passenger rail, are among the highest value investments the Nation can make. These investments will provide benefits to the Nation for, the hundred, for hundreds of years. We know this committee recognizes the importance of transportation investment to the Nation's economic competitiveness and prosperity. Expansion and improvement of our current intercity passenger rail system <coughs> will require a commitment of Federal, State, local and private resources, a combination of funding and financing strategies that will not only pay for projects but also speed their planning, design and construction. APTA recommends an authorization of $50 billion over six years to facilitate the development of high-speed intercity passenger rail funded by a dedicated and indexed Federal Reserve uh, revenue source and complemented by the use of public-private partnerships. With regard to rail safety, APTA is unequivocally committed to safety, with passenger and employee safety being number one priority for our nation's commuter railroads. Since its inception, APTA has been an advocate for safety improvements, and we are always working to make our industry safer. APTA's standards program and safety audit program are examples of the ways the industry promotes safety, and I have described both in my written testimony. With regard to positive train control, APTA has consistently supported the concept of PTC, provided that proven technology, resources and radio spectrum were available, a position that, re that predates the Rail Safety Improvement Act. APTA is working with its member railroads to meet the law's requirements that all of the nation's commuter railroads have federally approved systems to help protect against accidents. We want to work with this committee on how to get PTC systems installed on commuter railroads in an optimized fashion. Some commuter railroads already have collision avoidance systems, some of which have been in place for years. But there is still no off-the-shelf technology which is capable of achieving all of the law's safety objectives today. Key components of PTC systems such as back office software, upgrades or revisions, roadway worker protection are still in the development stage. It requires newly designed radios and large amounts of radio spectrum to deliver information to trains and achieve interoperability between carriers. And it requires testing in the actual commuter rail operating environment. And above all, implementation costs are challenging especially for publicly operated commuter railroads trying to deal with hundreds of state of good repair projects unrelated to PTC, many of which also impact directly on the safety of operations. Implementation costs for commuter railroads exceed $2 billion, not including operating and spectrum costs. This is on top of many costs the railroads are incurring on the East Coast as they deal with the issues of repair and rehabilitation related to Hurricane Sandy. We have told Congress for several years that we are concerned about the ability to implement PTC on all of the Nation's commuter railroads by the 2015 deadline, and we have sought Federal funding to help commuter railroads pay for the cost of PTC implementation. We have also asked the FCC and Congress to provide rec radio spectrum without cost on the basis of public safety. And given all these challenges, we recommended the deadline for implementation be extended from 2015 to 2018 to allow for a complete and orderly system integration. APTA appreciates the opportunity to testify today. We will be happy to try and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hamburger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Brown and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss reauthorization of PREA. All of us want passenger railroads that are safe, efficient and responsive to the transportation needs of the country. At the same time, America cannot prosper in an increasingly competitive global marketplace without a best-in-the-world freight rail system. We think our Nation can have both, a safe and effective passenger rail service and a safe, productive, world-best freight rail system. Freight railroads want passenger railroads to succeed. We work cooperatively with passenger and commuter railroads to help make this happen, and we support government efforts to grow passenger rail in ways that complement freight rail growth. As Mr. Zabo has said on more than one occasion, 
Yes, America deserves a world-class passenger rail system, but not if it comes at the expense of what is already the world's best freight rail system. As I have said more than once before, our nation's freight railroads are overwhelmingly privately owned and operate almost exclusively on infrastructure that they own, build, maintain, and pay for themselves. In fact, this year alone, $25 billion private capital will go back into the infrastructure, 40 cents on every dollar, to grow, maintain, and expand uh, our infrastructure. But I draw your attention to the fact that it's not that way for passenger rail, either here or anywhere else in the world. I respectfully suggest that once you as policymakers agree on the nature and scope of passenger railroading in this country, you must be willing to commit public funds on a long-term basis commensurate with that determination. Moreover, Amtrak cannot plan, build, and maintain adequate infrastructure that provides optimal transportation mobility and connectivity when there is so much uncertainty regarding what its capital and operating funding will be from one year to the next. Having said that, the establishment and management of schedules and on-time performance between Amtrak and the host freight railroads should be undertaken jointly by those parties in a contractual basis. It should be governed by privately bilateral contracts and the facts and circumstances of particular routes, not by one-size-fits-all legislative mandates. As you take a look at reauthorization of PREA, we have five principles that we think could help guide your considerations. First, safety has to take priority over anything else. Under certain conditions, passenger rail can operate on freight rail tracks at more than 79 miles an hour. In general, however, we believe that more than 79 miles an hour requires a separate track. Where there is a separate track for passenger rail, we think it should be separate far enough away so that if there is an accident, uh, that uh, it does not foul the adjacent track, uh, uh, having even more uh, tragic consequences. Uh, second, capacity issues must be properly addressed. Additional passenger uh, train operations should both preserve the ability to operate freight trains as needed today and the opportunity to expand further freight service as our customers require in the future. Third, if passenger trains use freight railroad assets and property, it is reasonable for the freight railroad to expect full and fair compensation. Fourth, freight railroads must be adequately protected from liability that would not have resulted but for the added presence of passenger rail service. Finally, there can be no one-size-fits-all approach. Each project involving passenger rail in general uh, or high-speed rail projects in particular has its own unique challenges and circumstances and should be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. In my final minute, I would just uh, like to draw your attention uh, to uh, my uh, written testimony where we go into great detail, as Mr. Milanofi just had, uh, on the challenges of implementing positive train control. We join APTA in calling for an extension. Uh, our proposal is for three years, uh, plus an additional uh, two years at the Secretary's discretion because of the unknown uh, challenges that are out there. And let me make it very clear. We are not looking for a repeal of this. We are committed to it. We spent $3 billion. We have thousands of employees working on it. There are challenges as we try to develop the technology, as we try to develop the new radios, as we try to develop and install uh, the equipment on 22,000 locomotives, 60,000 miles. Much of it will be installed by 2015. All of it will not be. We want to work with this committee to see if we can uh, work uh, through an extension uh, that allows this to be done. But you have our commitment that we are committed to doing to do it, and we will get it done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamburger. Mr. Lewis. Chairman Dunham, um, Ranking Member Brown, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. Um, my name is Mike Lewis, and I'm the director of the Rhode Island Department of Transportation, but today I'm testifying on behalf of AASHTO as its current president. Uh, I also serve as a member of the Northeast Corridor Commission. AASHTO's position on national rail policy has evolved through many years of state experience with delivering passenger rail service and working with and supporting large and small freight railroads. Dating back to AASHTO's 2002 Freight Rail Bottom Line Report, we have highlighted public-private partnerships as a model for investment in freight rail projects. Rail must be a part of a balance of transportation, a balanced mix of transportation alternatives available to our nation's freight trippers and the traveling public. 
Making increased levels of investment and realizing the public benefits of a strong freight rail system will require partnerships among the railroads, the states, and the federal government. The Heartland Corridor and the Nation National Gateway Corridor are major intermodal, intermodal connector projects resulting from shifting patterns of freight demand. These and similar projects make it clear that we must constantly adapt to changing global economics and logistics and that rail is a central element of our overall national transportation system. Continued federal investment is essential. Without it, the result, the resulting, uh, without it, an increased reliance on the highway system would greatly increase highway congestion and maintenance costs, driving up overall costs of goods movements in the, in the U.S. The recently formed National Freight Advisory Committee will provide a forum for integrating freight within all modes. Two AASHTO board members have been selected to serve on the committee, Secretary Ann Schneider of Illinois uh, and Mike Tooley of the Mon Montana DOT. Having spent my career in transportation first in Massachusetts and now in Rhode Island, I'm most familiar with rail service in the Northeast. Demand on the NEC is at record levels. The NEC, however, cannot continue to accommodate rising demand due to infrastructure that is highly congested and in need of repair. With more than 2,000 trains per day and major segment, segments at or near capacity, operating the NEC leaves little room for error. As we saw with recent closures of parts of the corridor due to the commuter rail accident in Connecticut and as recently as Tuesday with the derailment of Amtrak construction equipment in Rhode Island. By bringing key stakeholders to the table, the NEC Commission is making a difference. For the first time, all the stakeholders are joining together to develop a corridor-wide five-year capital program. A fundamental tenet of the capital program is that funds generated by increased state and Amtrak financial contributions will not supplant existing federal funding, but be used to leverage higher levels of overall federal and state investment. The NEC Commission is a model for collaboration that can be used in other corridors across the U.S. The states have been providing funding assistance to Amtrak outside the Northeast Corridor as well. In 2013, 15 states either partially or completely supported Amtrak service. Under the provisions of PREA Section 209, all short-distance Amtrak corridors uh, must become state-supported routes and states must pay the proportional costs associated with their respective corridor. States continue to work cooperatively with Amtrak and are now in the process of contract negotiations looking at the list of items provided under the 209 pricing policy to determine the best use of state resources. So what should be included? National rail policy must be just that, a national policy. As AASHTO policy states, a robust national rail transportation network that moves both passenger and freight effectively and efficiently across international borders, state lines, and within regional and state boundaries is essential to this nation's continued growth and vitality. Safety continues to be our first priority. We must look at corridor-specific measures that will reduce fatalities and injuries and allow states the flexibility to use new technology, combine resources, and partner with the private sector in innovative approaches that will lead to zero deaths, including those at rail, highway, grade crossings. As called for in PREA, a national rail plan should be the vision for both freight and passenger. To implement this plan, Congress must provide a long-term sta stable funding for intercity passenger rail. Federal investment for intercity passenger rail in the Northeast Corridor, in state corridors, and improving the national network of intercity passenger rail, including long-distance trains, should, allow, should follow a model similar to that proposed by the FRA, which consolidates rail programs to focus on existing passenger service state of good repair and expand and improve passenger and freight networks in order to accommodate growing demand. In addition, the MAP-21 project delivery streamlining measures should be extended to rail projects, both freight and passenger. The amount of time that it takes for a rail project to move from planning to actual construction could be reduced by half, saving millions in construction costs. The journey to defining and executing a national rail policy will be a long one, but today is a good day to start. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before the committee and will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Tolman. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Denham and Ranking Member uh, Brown, members of the subcommittee. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak here today. On behalf of the 37,000 uh, active Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers members, and trainmen over, and over 70,000 uh, rail conference members, I want to thank the committee. The BLET supports the concept of a unified national plan for our nation's, railroad, nation's passenger and freight railroads. It is consistent with our desire for long-term planning and, finan and financing of rail. It is also imperative that any national rail policy would protect the interest of the men and women who work in the railroad industry today. 
In order for our nation to meet the economic and environmental challenges that we face, we must continue to invest in the infrastructure and to, the, and to develop and plan for new means to get goods and people from place to place in the most fuel efficient means possible. Rail clearly is the best means of doing this. On the passenger side, Amtrak and inner city commuter rail, railroads and its employees have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to develop and implement and grow passenger rail uh, systems throughout this country. They have done great work and continue to set record riderships across the country. Uh, they could, uh, passenger rail is a great example of the old quote in the field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. On the Amtrak side, this cycle of underfunding must end. They desperately need long-term funding and predictability. Most troubling uh, currently of all labor is a recent proposed House Appropriations Budget for Fiscal Year 2014. The bill would cut the FRA by 40 percent. On the freight railroads, uh, freight side, and with professional skilled railroad employees, intermodal freight transportation is the way of the future with goods moving from ship to truck to train on a seamless ne network. To continue this, we need to ensure that we continue to invest in our infrastructure. Unfortunately, the House approves spending leaves Tiger grants out entirely and also tries to cut this year's awards in half by rescinding $237 million before the DOT can get the already awarded grants out the door. Railroads have improved their fuel efficiency by 23% in the last two decades. As stated by uh, uh, Ed Hamburg, the freight side in the industry is investing billions annually in its infrastructure and is well positioned to handle any additional freight that comes its way. But we must also so ensure that continued investment are not only to expand the capacity, but also to improve safety. Along these lines of safety, PTC will save lives, and the BLET strongly supports the implementation of PTC on our nation's railroads. This technology will prevent the most egregious and catastrophic accidents throughout our nation. All too often, cost-benefit analysis is used as a sole objection against moving ahead on rail, rail safety projects. If we could rewind the time and freeze the movement before a fatal, any fatal accident, such as McDonough, Texas, or Graniteville, North Carolina, occurred, and talk to the train crew or talk to the residents, who among us would, would like to explain to them that they would die of an accident, not from the accident itself, but, but from the smoke or hazardous materials inhalation because of the congressionally mandated emergency escape apparatus, breathing apparatus in switch points indicators failed a cost benefit analysis. Let's work together to implement a feasible protective safety opportunities for the public and for its employees. As Ed Hamburg testified last week in front of the Senate, and he stated job safety is the number one issue for the industry. So let's walk the walk and talk the talk and get things done together. The nat a national rail policy must take all factors into account, including connectivity to provide service nationwide. Now is the time to stimulate the economy and to invest in jobs, the number one issue in the last national election, jobs, through the creation of good passenger rail system throughout the nation. For every $1 billion invested in, in uh, high-speed rail or rail passenger, it could create 47,000 jobs based on a DOT study and a Federal Transit Administration study. Uh, the work is currently employed by our nation's railroads among the highly, highly skilled employees in the world. They are entitled to a safe work environment, and any comprehensive rail plan should not interfere with their ability to keep and expand their work. In conclusion, we would like to reinforce the need for Amtrak long-term funding and continued need for for cooperation between the freight, railroads, and labor to provide a stimulus to our industry, to the economy, and the need to do, we need to do this the other. while making critical strides to enhance safety. 
once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mr. Tolman. Thank you to all of our witnesses. Uh, as always, we'll be doing the five-minute rule. We will uh, plan on at least two rounds of questioning with such a large panel. Uh, I'm going to start things off with Mr. Zabo. Um, we have gone uh, round and round a couple times on budgets. I imagine that we will go round and round several more times on it, uh, especially with the House Appropriations uh, uh, Committee recently making their plans known. Uh, but I want to get a realistic view from a committee standpoint on what our priorities for pre reauthorization are, what are our realistic projects we can actually accomplish, uh, giving a bipartisan effort between the two houses. Um, you start with your budget at $2.7 billion. The, uh, the Senate budget is current funding, which is $1.45, and then the House now at, at uh, uh, $0.95 billion. What do you, I mean, best case scenario, I think, is current funding. I mean, if the, that's the Senate's starting point and the House is lower, I imagine we're going to uh, ultimately uh, get somewhere in between there. Uh, going much higher without some new funding source, which I would be encouraged to hear any efficiencies or new funding sources uh, that the administration is looking at. Uh, but best case right now today looks like would be that $1.4 billion or the current level of funding. What are some of the top programmatic reforms that you think will ensure the most efficient use of, of those Federal dollars? Well, I think if you take a look at our budget submission, it really clearly spells that out. Uh, our mission is to ensure the safe, reliable, and efficient movement of people and goods. When you start taking a look at the state of our transportation network today, the congestion costs and loss of productivity that our transportation network is already facing, and then when you take a look at the decades of underinvestment in rail, combine that with the efficiencies that uh, rail can uh, generate in moving people and goods, the enhanced productivity, the enhanced safety, uh, the improved uh, environmental uh, sustainability that the rail offers. Um, we believe that our budget proposal is not only realistic but certainly appropriate, that it is time that we truly put rail on parity with the other transportation modes, that we no longer treat it like a forgotten stepchild. And because of these decades of underinvestment, there is clearly this need to advance the vision forward of real commitment of dollars and a, uh, you know, a reliable and sustainable a funding pool out of a, uh, a rail account in the trust fund. Outside of the whole budget debate, because that, that debate is going to continue to go on, um, assuming we have extra money, yeah. we're going to need to put significant infrastructure repairs, not only uh, some uh, that uh, safety repairs that should have been done decades ago, but certainly areas that we can cre create greater efficiencies. But in the PREA bill itself, we're looking for reforms that help us to create greater efficiencies or uh, greater use of taxpayer dollars. What types of reforms would you, I mean, do you think uh, state-supported routes is working well, and would you propose doing that in other uh, areas? Uh, are there other types of reforms that, uh, that you would yeah. be looking at? You know, I think if you take a look at our budget proposal, one of the key changes there uh, is the fact that we start breaking Amtrak down in the business lines, uh, which allows us greater transparency. Uh, we, we call for the preparation of a five-year plan according to each business line, which will allow us at FRA to, to be much more aggressive in uh, overseeing their implementation of each of those business lines and looking for continuous improvement uh, in uh, financial viability. Uh, you know, we do have to t start the discussion by acknowledging the fact that Amtrak's financial performance last year was the best in its 42-year history and has, in fact, improved each of the last four years. But uh, we also have to say that that's not good enough. 
and that we need to continue to drive uh, you know, that continuous improvement in their, their financial stability and reducing the support on federal tax dollars. Uh, in your testimony, you state that reorganize, reorganizing Amtrak grant structure will not work at, at, at the current levels. Amtrak's already putting together business lines. Uh, why wouldn't that, if it's working now, why would not that not be something that could work at, at current levels? We really did our due diligence in putting together the plan to understand what it's really going to take to ensure that safety, efficiency, and reliability of each of those business lines. And we absolutely believe that each of those business lines are important to meeting the transportation needs of the traveling public. And to go at any level less than that, particularly, particularly the level that the House came out with, would negatively affect safety, it would neg negatively affect reliability and the efficiency of the network, and would likely increase costs uh, for the states under Section 209, as well as uh, increased costs for the commuters under Section 212. Thank you. I realize, again, we're going to have this ongoing debate on budget, but we have to be able to figure out something in realistic reforms, and, and that's why I'll continue to ask this question about business lines. It's working. Amtrak is working on business lines today under current budget scenarios. We want to take all of the good things that are happening today under the previous PREA bill, and regardless of where we end up on this budget debate, make sure we've got a good package to move forward that continues to improve efficiencies and safety throughout. I'm out of time. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to also thank you for uh, the field trips that we've, we've had. The one that we took up to the Northeast Quarter was extremely uh, educational for everybody on the committee. And one of the things with Sandy, what happened, Mr. Lewis, with the tunnels, what is it that we need to do to make sure that these man-made disasters, uh, that we harden those situations? Short of raising the level of the continent, um, yes, sir. We have, uh, first of all, we have to recognize, as you have, the vulnerability of the existing infrastructure that we have, um, and to be able to address through um, a series of uh, prioritization of projects, how do we protect those that infrastructure um, and its exposure? I mean, we all recognize, just taking the NEC, the Northeast Corridor, for example, the numbers of trips, two, over 2,000 train trips a day on the corridor, the numbers of people that are served by that, as well as, 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 as well as freight the value to the nation's economy of those trips. They are absolutely vital that we protect those interests. So in our planning and prioritization of infrastructure improvements, we need to take into account um, these more recent um, risks that we have in front of us. Some of my uh, colleagues want to uh, require that the states pay for long distance service. What is your opinion of, of that? As I said in my testimony, I think there is a, a role for all parties. Um, the states certainly have a role to play. The federal government is, is, is a necessary component of that. The states have stepped up um, as they are under 209 and under PREA um, and under 212 um, for greater in investment. Um, we do need to be sure, if the states are going to step up, and, and all of you know how difficult state budgets are um, and the challenges in front of many states, and when, if we are going to go and, and sell increased investment to our state legislators, we need to be able to show them where that money is going and the value it brings to that state. So I think that is a, that's a challenge we have, um, but I think there is a willingness on the part of the states that we are, we are partners in this challenge. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Sabo, would you answer that question? And also, what is your opinion of the House proposed funding level for Amtrak? No, I find the, uh, the House proposed level uh, both concerning and a bit perplexing, you know, at a time when passenger rail, when Amtrak is the fastest growing transportation mode in the nation, uh, is vehicle miles driven by Americans continue to decline, and it's been on a, a downward trend over the past decade, uh, that we wouldn't be making the investments that are necessary uh, to truly make inner city passenger rail a viable part of a balanced transportation network. And uh, uh, as I said in the answer to my previous question uh, to the chair, uh, you know, it really is time that we take a look at how we enhance productivity, how we eliminate uh, the cost of congestion, uh, make sure that we allow states to plan out and build 
transportations that will allow people and goods to use the mode that is most efficient uh, for a journey, and for too long rail has been particularly passenger rail, the forgotten mode. It is clear that the um, House is behind the American people because the ridership is up about, what, 40 percent? Mr. Hamburg, my last question. Uh, with respect to the PTC and the spectrum issue, what can Congress do to assist you all? Because I understand there are some challenges there. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, with respect to spectrum, the freight railroads were able to get out quickly and procure enough uh, spectrum. I think the question really uh, on spectrum is more for APTA and Mr. Melanophy, but while you have raised the FCC, let me just put on your radar screen an issue that has just bubbled up in May of this year. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission has advised us to stop installing any more uh, antennae. Uh, we have about 22,000 more radio antennas to install, over 95 percent of which will be in our right-of-way. Uh, they uh, are right now uh, requesting that we perform an environmental assessment on each of those 22,000 antenna. Uh, we have had some meetings with them. They understand that that might uh, uh, take a few years and add even further to the delay. Uh, we are having meetings with them at the Commissioner level on down, uh, and we hope uh, with uh, the good assistance of uh, Mr. Zabro and his staff uh, to uh, come to a uh, more streamlined uh, work over at the FCC. If that doesn't uh, uh, happen, we might be back uh, asking for some, uh, for, for, for some relief of that. But having taken Mr. Milanofi's time, let me turn the spectrum over to him. No, we, just, we want to uh, reiterate that spectrum is a, is a critical piece, and this is a safety issue here. It is very important that the public agencies have access to spectrum. Certainly we appreciate the opportunity to work with Mr. Hamburger's members on access to, to spectrum and leasing spectrum. Uh, where, where it is available, but it is critical that we have access to that spectrum and that we are uh, recommending that it be given at no cost to the public sector operators so that they can provide this safety service to their members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barletta. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Zabo, you, um, you talked a lot about the underinvestment um, of the government, of the Federal Government. I would like to talk about the RIF program. Mm -hmm. Uh, something that is very interesting to me, being a former businessman and understanding how important it is to make the capital investments back into the, into the industry, I thought this is a, a great program. Now, the RIF program has been on the books since uh, 2000, has an authorization of $35 billion for investment in rail infrastructure, which we all agree is critical. Yet, as I understand it, the Federal Rail Administration has only approved $1.7 billion in loans since 2000. Why is the uh, RIF program so underutilized when our rail infrastructure needs such investment? Yeah, I think as we start uh, talking through greater specifics for, uh, for reauthorization, this is an area that we would like to have some additional conversation with the committee on how we do make RIF more usable uh, for the industry, in particular the short lines. Uh, to a great extent over the past decade, uh, through some statutory change, the program has kind of lost its, uh, its initial focus on trying to make sure that capital dollars are available for these smaller short line railroads that are so capitally starved. Um, and there is no question that short lines have a more difficult time getting through the process to, to be deemed uh, you know, uh, eligible for, for a loan. The Class ones can get through. They have got all their financials in order. Uh, you know, it is a relatively routine process for them. For the mom and pops, it is more of a struggle. So a couple of things that we are doing now, as well as one thing that we have proposed in our budget, uh, to help mom and pops get through the RIF process more expeditiously and to better understand what it is, we started forming some joint partnerships with states. And uh, the uh, State of Ohio, their Development Commission, was actually the first that we were able to partner with to where they take the, the leadership in becoming the RIF expert for all of the short lines in the State of Ohio in providing that early upfront guidance to them and helping them through the process to actually get them through the process much more quickly. 
what, what's the average time from start to finish uh, for the loans that you've completed? Yeah. We're required that once an application is complete to have it through the process in 90 days, and we meet that goal. The challenge has always been getting all of the information in up front to make that application complete. And so with programs like the one that we've put together in Ohio, we're going to enhance the, uh, the applicant's ability to have a full application, to understand everything that is needed of them, and uh, get it through them the process that much more quickly. But also going back to our budget, you'll notice that we talk about the need for grants for freight rail infrastructure improvements, and short lines would clearly be eligible here. Uh, what we have found is that so often there are short lines that are desperate for capital, but they cannot qualify for a loan. And uh, we believe in these cases, particularly for safety enhancements, uh, bridges, tracks, track improvements, uh, that uh, grants would be in a more, more appropriate tool. Now, Deputy Secretary Percari pledged to improve the RIF program. What was it that he was trying to accomplish? I mean, he admitted that it needed to be improved. Yep. So I don't put the focus all on the short lines or, or, the, or the rail industry. It, I think there's a problem in the program in, the, in it being administered. And I think there's, people have admitted that. So this has been 13 years, $35 billion uh, 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 authorized, but only 1.7 yeah. actually utilized. What, what was it that he was trying to accomplish? Actually, what we've accomplished, the, uh, you know, going out and working with the states now, uh, it's going to dramatically reduce the, uh, the time to get a loan through the process and make sure that better information is provided up front which will allow us to start that 90-day clock sooner and make sure that we continue to hit our 90-day deadline for all of those applications. But I, but I think there are other things that can be done. And again, as we uh, get into reauthorization, uh, some conversations that we might be able to have on how we might be able to better simplify the process for those mom and pops to get that capital in their hands. Quick, quick question to Mr. Uh, Milanofi. Do you think there have been any improvements uh, to, to the RIF program since a Deputy Secretary pledged to improve it in 2011? Chris, I think the, the key here is that, uh, unlike the TIFIA program, there are no funds uh, appropriated for the credit subsidy of the RIF loans. And each loan applicant must pay the credit subsidy cost of their own loan. And while well, they can pledge capital, uh, against the program, it, it adds to the cost of the overall project. Like we need to look at how the TIFIA program is structured and look to see if there are ways to align the RIF program to be more in alignment with how the TIFIA program is structured with respect to buying down the, the risk of the project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the panelists for being here. You know, uh, Ridership along the uh, Northeast Corridor is strong, is growing. Uh, we obviously face uh, urgent need on investment in the infrastructure. Uh, in the past three years, all we seem to talk about is how to privatize this, yet we're performing rather well instead of talking about investments on, 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 that they need. Can the panelists uh, provide me with their perspective on how privatizing the Northeast Corridor will affect both the cost of riders and the level of service that they will be provided, and whether or not privatization will affect the kind of long-term investment in infrastructure that the Northeast Corridor will require in the next 20 to 30 years? Can somebody take a shot at that? <laughs> we can either start with Mike and finish with me or uh, vice versa. Um, the most important thing we can do for the future of the Northeast Corridor is to allow the good work of the Northeast Corridor Commission to continue moving forward, uh, as well as make the investments that we're proposing in our budget proposal and ensure the certainty, the predictability, and reliability of funding to, uh, you know, to make those necessary state of good repair improvements, as well as in investing in the corridor for the next generation of service. This is clearly one of the best markets in the world. And with the limited resources, some remarkable things have been done over the past 15 years. 
uh, uh, a majority of passengers flew between New York and D.C., and since the introduction of the Acela service, that has been completely turned around to where it's pushing close to, I think, 80 percent now uh, that are traveling by train. One more. Uh, yeah, and, and just 20 percent that's shared by all of the, the airlines put together. But when you start talking about what role privatization has, there certainly is likely going to be an opportunity for private capital in the corridor. But I really think that the Commission is the one that needs to be able to determine what is the appropriate role and when uh, that role takes place to ensure the, uh, the capital comes into the corridor. You won't care to speculate how it will affect the, uh, the price for the customers and, and investment in infrastructure? Well, we don't advocate for privatization of the service. Uh, it, it, to go back to what I said, I think there may be the opportunity for private capital into the infrastructure, but uh, ultimately it is about you know, the, the safe, efficient reliability of the service for the passengers for the cost that they have to pay. And uh, you know, we believe that the, uh, the, uh, the approach that is taken today with appropriate investment is the approach that needs to continue. You know, I know the question was raised before about natural disasters. I had a first-hand look at what happened with Sandy. You talk about predictability. There's really no predictability uh, when it comes to uh, how, how do you uh, deal with uh, when you do capital budgets and then all of a sudden you get hit with a storm like Sandy that throws your capital budget all out of whack? Well, I think the biggest thing that we have to ensure moving forward, and this is not just from a rail standpoint, but in all of our infrastructure, is that we are now designing resiliency uh, as well as potential recovery into the design of all transportation projects. Uh, in my mind, there is just no question that weather patterns are going to continue to become more and more uncertain uh, and more and more severe. And so uh, we have to have redundancy uh, as well as resiliency built into our transportation network. Because I know the ports by me, Port of Elizabeth, Port of Newark, obviously they are looking at the same thing. But, you know, if the ports don't work or they're shut down or you are shut down, you know, 80 percent of the merchandise that comes through those ports is consuming the region. And you can't move it. You know, people, you know, it's just, I don't know how you, we, how we can be predictable on anything like that. Yeah. You know, one of the first calls that I made uh, uh, after Sandy hit was to, to Ed Hamburger, you know, just to better understand how we could divert freight and keep freight flowing to uh, you know, those ports that weren't affected and understanding what rail infrastructure had not been uh, you know, harmed and you know, how we try and keep those goods flowing. Yeah, the port was shut down for just about a week, yep. basically. So no matter how many railroad carts he brings down, <laughs> not going to get <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Webster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For bringing this panel together. I have a question of Mr. Lewis. You mentioned having a, uh, a um, national freight policy, uh, and we can't do earmarks, okay? So that would be the easiest way to do it. So now we can't do that. So does, does AASHTO have any sort of recommendations how we can maintain the State's flexibility, which we give a lot of flexibility in much of the planning uh, from, you know, highways and other means of transportation, we give you lots of flexibility. Uh, and, and yet with this, if we are going to do something regionally, we might be squeezing down on that flexibility. Uh, so my thought is, uh, do you have any recommendations? Sure. Congressman, I think it's a great question. I, I think, first of all, we can't talk about a national policy unless we're all talking collectively with all modes. And I think the, the, the Northeast Corridor Commission that, that uh, Administrator Zabo talked to is a good, it's a good model, smaller scale, but it's, it's, a, it's all of the states in the Northeast Corridor getting together, recognizing that working together each of their interests are being served, that working with the freight railroads, working with USDOT, working with Amtrak, we have a common interest. Um, there are different, you know, different areas. Each one of us have our own concerns, but there is a common interest, and it doesn't work unless we are all working on those common interests. I think on a, on a Federal level, um, we at AASHTO do 
um, espouse greatest flexibility for decision making and transportation of states. But we all recognize that we all work as an overall system. The interstate highway system only works because there's connectivity so that you can take um, goods that come in from the port of Long Beach and they can drive across Wyoming, Wyoming and end up in Providence, Rhode Island. That's the system. That's how the system works. The f we view the freight policy needs to be the same. It needs to incorporate the ports. It needs to incorporate inland waterways. It needs to incorporate the highways and railroad. It's all part of the system, and I think that's what we're, that's what we're supporting. Okay. So, so should that be formalized in that, okay, they have, what they've done is, is somewhat voluntary. Um, should we formalize that as federal policy? I mean, we, we require um, metropolitan planning organizations to build from a local up uh, plans. Uh, should we engage ourselves in doing some sort of uh, uh, requirement for regional compacts of some sort? Requirements, um, I'm not sure um, on behalf of Ashton. Versus voluntary. I mean, but voluntary is a little risky. It, but voluntary, um, it's it, going to the, the NEC Commission. It, we, the Commission is a requirement. The outcome is not. We have to voluntarily work together to get a result. Um, I think that there is an opportunity. I think there's a recognition across the country that um, we need to work as systems, as a, as a system. Um, I think the states recognize that. The states recognize that there's interdependency. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm loath to say um, supporting requirements in that vein, um, but I wouldn't rule it out if, if we don't reach success. success. Somebody else want to? Yeah, Congressman, that? if I uh, may add, if, again, if you go back and look at our proposal, one of the key things we talk about in there is enhancing regional planning for passenger and freight rail, uh, you know, uh, projects, and that, uh, uh, in essence, we would like to see some kind of duplication of the Northeast Corridor in other key regions, understanding that whether we're talking about moving people or goods, uh, in most cases it doesn't stop at the state lines and that it needs to be looked at regionally. So do you think, uh, though, that should be a more formal uh, request by us through legislation, or is that something uh, that could be done voluntarily? It's kind of hard. Uh, I, I think we have to talk about that a little bit. I think it needs to be strongly encouraged. Uh, I'm not sure it's appropriate to mandate it. Uh, as uh, Secretary Lewis said, uh, the NEC works together. So what yes, if we, let, me, let me ask you this. What, what if we funded uh, those that decided to do it? Yeah, and I think those are parts of the way that you encourage. Uh, you know, good planning has to be the foundation of everything that we do. And so, yes, to be eligible for funding, you know, having a, a regional ent entity that is, you know, doing the appropriate planning and, and coordinating the project, I think, would be appropriate. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Lipinski. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to start uh, by following up on Mr. Barletta's uh, questions about uh, RIF, because I think uh, RIF could be of much greater value if uh, we're able to uh, get more of that money out to the uh, to the railroads. A uh, couple of things I'd like to to ask Mr. Zabo. Um, do you know how many active formal applications are currently being worked on? I can, can get you that for the record. Okay, uh, and and you're saying that once everything is in, right, that it is meeting the um, the 90 day. That is correct. Uh, the 90 days. Um, so. Uh, I wanted to ask, is the, um, what role, how much of a role does OMB play here? Does, does the role of OMB uh, lead to any delays in the, the process? It's a complex process. I mean, obviously, there's the work and due diligence my staff has to do, and then there's a process uh, through OST, and then there's a process with OMB uh, for ultimate approval. And obviously, all of them are trying to ensure that we do not place the federal taxpayers in a you know, position of any uh, undue risk and to make sure that it's a loan that can uh, 
reach the determination of repayability, which is statutorily required, and so uh, it's a multiple-step process. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, having a discussion about what we can do, uh, especially legislatively here, to uh, to make the uh, make the program more more functional, uh, get more of that money out. Uh, out the door, more of those loans out the door, uh, and, and I certainly do like the idea of uh, uh, of a grant program. Although you know, as we all know, how dif how difficult that is uh, these days. And yet, Congressman, I would offer that in some of these cases, you know, we see these apps come in from the you know from some of these small railroads, and they desperately need the money, and yet they can't qualify for the loan. And so, if we don't find a way to get them capital. Uh, we, we run the risk of losing that service. And I, I 100 percent agree with you on that. Uh, and it's something that we need to be, to, to be working on further. Uh, I want to move on to uh, Mr. Hamburger. Uh, we were sitting here less than 24 hours ago uh, in these same places. Um, and the, uh, the at that point, you're testifying for the uh, 21st Century Freight Transportation um, Panel. Uh, and we talked about at the time the CREATE program in Northeast Illinois, and how important it is to the freight network uh, of the country. I'm not sure how many times we have sat in these seats and talked about CREATE, but uh, I'm very happy that uh, CREATE has been moving forward, although not as quickly as any of us would like to see, but uh, about $1.2 billion has been committed uh, to, the, uh, to the program. Uh, the, to, of the uh, contains about 70 projects. Uh, what I have um, been more concerned about recently, the bigger projects are not getting getting done, um, and these are projects that really impact two of the things that we're talking about here: passenger rail and, and safety. Uh, the rail flyovers uh, are, you know, one of them, uh, Inglewood flyover, has has received uh, funding, is in the process of construction now. Uh, so rail flyovers really help for uh, uh, passenger rail, especially freight also. But uh, I want to focus more on uh, a safety aspect, which is the highway gr rail grade separations. Uh, we have made tremendous project progress, I have said, on the rail corridors, uh, but only two of the 25 grade separations are complete. Uh, there are three or four others that have, have the funding, but uh, that is not too far along with the 25. So I want to ask, uh, because these are important for, for safety, obviously, uh, how high of a priority are these projects for the railroads, and uh, how, do you, how do we move better more quickly in getting these, uh, these projects done? I am not sure I have an answer to the second part. The first part is, uh, uh, very high priority, and in fact, I believe, as, as you know, and I would be glad to provide uh, for the com subcommittee, uh, we have committed uh, in a letter from me to Secretary Ann Schneider uh, additional funding uh, for all the grade crossing, uh, it, it, consistent with uh, State and Federal uh, law, that we will participate. And we have also uh, added additional money uh, commitment for the 75th Street SIP. So uh, we, we see these as high priorities, and we want to continue to work with the City and the State. And I go back to Mr. Webster's question about planning. Uh, this is an, a, a very great example of voluntary planning uh, uh, among a variety of, uh, of, of, of parties, the Federal Government, the State, the, uh, the City of Chicago, and the private sector. So it, 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 it is working on, on a voluntary basis. Well, I'd just like to say I'd, uh, I, I appreciate that, but I would certainly like to see my constituents and people of the area would like, like to see more uh, committed to, uh, to those grade separation. We can continue to, uh, to talk about that. Well, as, as you know, Congressman, those, uh, uh, that all of those projects uh, have been put on a, on a chart and are planned uh, in, in cooperative fashion with uh, the uh, Secretary uh, Schneider and her staff, uh, the Commissioner of uh, Chicago and the and the freight railroads and Amtrak and Metro. So, we well, appreciate knowing of, of your. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Williams. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you for being here today, and uh, you you represent a great industry, and one where in my house we still run Lionel trains for 60 years. So, uh, we uh, and also, uh, Mr. Tallman, I appreciate your comment about jobs. I'm from the private sector. I'm from Texas. 
and uh, I'm all about jobs and, and business, and so thank you for those comments. Uh, what I would like to ask, uh, I guess uh, Mr. Hamburger touched on it earlier, uh, Mr. Zabo, uh, and we talked about in 2008 Congress enacted the uh, positive train control mandate, and which uh, it's an unfunded mandate that uh, uh, makes uh, freight railroads and passenger railroads comply, such as in my district, uh, Austin's uh, capital metro system. Uh, it sounds to me from what I've heard and, and seen that nobody but uh, possibly BNSF will achieve implementation of this on an on-time basis. And in Austin, the commuter rail system was started entirely with private funding uh, just a few years ago, and the cost to deploy this technology is going to be about one-third the cost to build the entire line. Uh, so my concerns are that unfunded mandates discourage both the private and local infrastructure investment. And I understand there's been efforts to delay the implementation. We've heard about this today uh, and uh, uh, from some of the others up to 2018. And my question is, would you, would you support that? And is it realistic? Is 2018 a realistic date? Our goal is to ensure that uh, PTC is implemented as timely as possible uh, while understanding the complexities of, uh, of that timely implementation. Um, the report that we provided to Congress last year you know, clearly indicates that the industry will achieve partial deployment by the congressionally mandated uh, deadline of uh, December uh, 2015, but that full deployment is uh, virtually uh, impossible uh, for most of the carriers. The, uh, the approach that FRA recommended in, uh, in our report to you, ultimately this decision belongs to Congress, but we think that there has to be a balance uh, between ensuring that due diligence is, is maintained to implement as timely as possible, while also recognizing those very real technological and programmatic challenges that most carriers are facing. That is why we recommend, rather than a blanket extension, that you grant to us authority to work with each carrier to amend their implementation plan so, on a case-by-case -case basis, we can understand both the due diligence that that particular railroad has made in their good faith effort, as well as the legitimacy of all of those challenges that are out there, and then customize an implementation plan for each railroad. All right. Uh, I guess the next question I have would be to you, Mr. Hamburger. You talked about safety concerns uh, with attempting uh, on the implement of PTC by 2015. Is, on those safety concerns, is 2018 achievable? I mean, does that give us enough time to? We believe that by 2018 we will be substantially, uh, 85, 90 percent uh, implemented. Uh, uh, but there, there are some unknowns. Uh, we, we say that with a 70 percent uh, uh, degree of uh, confidence uh, because there are still some, uh, the, the major challenge right now is the back office software, uh, which will allow the dispatch centers of each of the 30, 40 railroads to talk to everybody else's dispatch center and everybody else's locomotive as uh, the locomotives uh, uh, traverse over other rails. Uh, we have to make sure that we are interoperable with all of uh, APTA members, with Amtrak, and that back office uh, code has not yet been delivered. Uh, we hope to see it sometime this summer, test it in the labs, and then get it out on the road for testing, uh, hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, you may find this hard to believe, but not every software uh, that is uh, first written uh, is 100 percent uh, uh, reliable. Uh, and so we are concerned, and, and I would draw your attention to GAO, which submitted testimony to the Senate Commerce Committee last week. Uh, they drew uh, the Senate Commerce Committee attention to the fact that we are striving so much to meet that 2015 deadline that they are concerned that some of this uh, may be deployed without adequate testing. They believe that that might be a safety issue. We think that unlike uh, the administrator, there needs to be some certainty, uh, there needs to be an extension of uh, at least three years. Uh, and uh, in that regard, uh, we also believe that there needs to be uh, some regulatory forbearance until the entire uh, system uh, is uh, certified as uh, up and safe. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Uh, Ms. Napolitano. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Sabo, in 2008, uh, rail safety bill, it was a requirement the uh, 10 uh, states with the most great crossing accidents to develop and submit their uh, two-year department to our agency action plans for reducing the accidents. Um, do we have a status of that, and is and how is uh, your agency monitoring the implementation of the plans? We'll give you a full status report for the record, but let me say this. We continue to execute that. We think it's very important. Uh, some of the states uh, have had their plans submitted and approved. Others have submitted and we're still working with them on approval. Uh, but if you take a look at the safety risk that is out there, you know, while we've seen continuous improvement in the rail industry over the past decade, uh, you know, in a 40, uh, better than 40 percent reduction in accidents and injuries for the industry as a whole, grade crossing safety and pedestrian safety continues to be a, a vexing challenge. There's been improvements, but we've got a lot more work to do. Well, and, and that I understand, but certainly we'd like to see what states are supporting, and I'd like a, a, uh, this committee to get a copy of those uh, uh, replies from the states and how, what states are moving up the line to get it implemented. Yeah, we'll get you a full and complete status Mr. report Chairman, on that for the record. For the record? A copy of the action plan of 2008 requirement to report uh, the states that have the highest accident rates, this committee, and what's happening with the action plan, and he has that. We would ask that to be submitted for the record. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, and then there's an issue of the safety. Uh, as you know, we've had uh, the Alameda Quarter East through my former district that uh, has great, uh, well, 54 great separation, uh, great crossings, and only about 20 are being have been separated, or half of them separated. One of my cities uh, requested the uh, um, quiet zone at a great expense. Other communities are looking at that and wanting it implemented, but they mm -hmm. cannot bear the cost. Uh, do we have any uh, idea of how we are going to be able to help those communities be able to protect the residents? And partly is uh, some of them uh, are concerned with the rail horns going right through cities. As you know, California is separated by streets, the cities, yep. so that uh, some of these rail crossings go right through either uh, commercial, industrial, uh, city halls, et cetera. And then some of the uh, communities who have uh, some of those safety concerns are worried about their children if Mm -hmm. the uh, uh, quiet zone established and they don't have a warning for crossing for right. pedestrian. Yeah, Congresswoman, let me start by saying I understand this firsthand as the mayor, former mayor of a community that had five railroads slicing through it, including two major freight rail yards. Through downtown. Uh, th through the entire community. So if you take a look at what we've proposed in our, our budget submission, uh, we explicitly set aside uh, a pot of money for what we call community mitigation. Right, uh, and that, that includes some of the raising of the medians and includes the quad gates and all of that. But absolutely, that? absolutely. So it would help communities, uh, you know, construct their quiet zones. More importantly, it would really help with the sealing of corridors. The safest grade crossing is one that doesn't exist at all. And so how do we work with communities to better design the closing of crossings with the strategic placement of overpasses and underpasses that are going to enhance rail safety, vehicle okay. safety, and pedestrian okay. My, safety. Well, how should we address this issue in the next railroad safety bill then? Uh, I'm sorry? How should we address this in our next uh, railroad safety, or safety bill? Approve our budget proposal. Which includes the funding to go yes, with it. Yes, ma'am. Is there any uh, chance of being able to consider helping communities that cannot afford uh, quad gates or some this, of the This would be a pot of money that they would be eligible to apply for under competitive grants. So it, it's all about the public benefits that would be achieved and the safety that would be advanced. Okay, then the other question, uh, California is three of the top five busiest state supported service routes in the country. The Surf Liner, the Capital Corridor, the San Joaquin Corridor. And Section 209 requires a state to pay for the losses. Uh, although California and don't, don't, other states don't like the provision, uh, they've accepted it. But a letter from Amtrak recently, as, as far back as April, indicated that uh, they would have to pay more, $40 million to be exact. 
Uh, do you see this new guidance as a problem to discontinue state supported passenger service routes? And what is the assessment and concerns and a resolution? Yeah, we need to make sure that the states and Amtrak end up in a good place, that there is full transparency to the numbers, a clear understanding of the services that the states are purchasing. Um, and that is why we have now taken leadership to help mediate those discussions between the, uh, the states and Amtrak. In fact, we are with David Kotrowski, who uh, runs one of your operations up in California this week. Feedback David gave, gave to me uh, was actually very positive on the progress, he believes, that is being made. But there are issues that we have to help the parties work through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bashan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, First of all, I am going to comment on the overall Federal budget. Again, we are at a hearing talking about discretionary spending being pinched. Uh, and uh, the elephant in the room is, is uh, this Congress, this government is not addressing the entire pie of Federal spending. We all know it. And as our mandatory spending continues to drive our national debt, we are going to continue to see discretionary spending programs tightened uh, to the point where we have issues like we are talking about today. I wanted to make that. Uh, uh, clear. Uh, Mr. Hamburger, uh, so I was interested in your comments about your uh, tower construction. Yes. On one hand, uh, the government, the Congress has mandated PTC, but then you, you made a comment about how, on the other hand, an, an agency of government has stopped tower construction. Um, that's that's going to significantly slow the process, is it, is it not? We uh, have uh, uh, determined and have advised the FCC that if we can get this worked out here in 2013, we think we can, uh, it will not slow us down any further. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, approvals and uh, uh, environmental assessments uh, in the past have taken two, three years just for one tower. Uh, there are uh, resource issues at the uh, FCC. Uh, I am led to believe that they handle two, three, four thousand such applications a year. Uh, we are hitting them with 22,000. Uh, so we are looking and working with them, again, with the uh, uh, support of DOT and FRA uh, to try to come up with some way to handle them in a more uh, batch group, if you will. Uh, and, and what we are trying to get across is that uh, for those that are on our right of way, and that is about 95 percent. Uh, these are just poles going up on our right of way uh, that maybe there should be some sort of categorical exclusion for those. Yeah. Uh, we have not yet gotten buy-in on that, but we're, we're working. Yeah. Do you have any idea why the FCC would, uh, is, this a, is this something new? I mean, they all of a sudden came out and said we need this review. Uh, and no, they have and regulations in place which we uh, over the years have been uh, abiding by in a uh, uh, more informal fashion, if you will. That is to say the railroad will go out. Uh, hire a uh, uh, consultant who will come back and say there are some issues here that you need to deal with. Uh, the, the major challenge is the uh, State Historical Preservation Office uh, and uh, Native American tribes. And so if there are issues that need to be brought to either of those uh, entities, we go to them and work through uh, mitigation or, or how to work it. Uh, with this uh, uh, big program, uh, the FCC seems to think there maybe there should be a more formal role for them, uh, which will, again, uh, uh, we think slow things down. We, 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 they, they understand the issue. They are working with us. Uh, but I did just want to get it on uh, your radar screen uh, in okay. case we need to come back. Well, I mean, I, I, this is only just my opinion. I mean, it may go along with uh, uh, the major speech that uh, the President gave and the, uh, the overall view, I think, of uh, these issues as it relates to this current administration. Uh, the other question I have for you is, uh, when, can you describe that the, uh, I mean, it is very important to have inter interaction between Amtrak, Amtrak and the infrastructure of your members. Uh, the on-time, the Amtrak on-time train situation and how, how, if there's issues related to that, how that works and how, the, how uh, that gets resolved in, uh, in general? If you are willing to speak. In the that. past, uh, the uh, individual freight uh, host railroad and Amtrak negotiated uh, contracts uh, that included both penalties and uh, 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 incentives uh, for on-time performance. And the, uh, the major uh, focus is, uh, is there freight train interference? 
uh, in achieving on-time performance. There are a lot of reasons an Amtrak train may not be on time. Uh, and uh, Mr. Series uh, uh, talked uh, eloquently about how do you schedule a railroad when you have Hurricane Sandy uh, coming your way. Uh, so there are a lot of issues, including uh, uh, Amtrak's own locomotives, uh, uh, perhaps not performing up to standard. So uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons for on-time performance not to be at 100 percent. Our focus is on where if, is there freight train interference. Uh, and so we have negotiated, I say we, the individual railroads, have negotiated contracts with Amtrak. We think that is the way it should be. Under the 2008 PREA uh, Act, uh, Congress uh, dictated that there should be a role for government in that, uh, that there should be an 85 percent on-time performance, uh, that the FRA and Amtrak should promulgate regulations, and the STB should uh, enforce those regulations. Uh, we have challenged uh, the constitutionality of the regulations uh, put out by Amtrak and FRA. Uh, that, uh, uh, litigation uh, was uh, heard uh, just, I think, in May was the, uh, uh, the oral argument, uh, and we expect uh, some decision on that later this year. Uh, should we not win that litigation, we would probably be back here asking you uh, to uh, change that uh, legislation uh, to, uh, ha again, put it back in the category of uh, 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 bilateral discussions between Amtrak and, and the freight railroads. Uh, we think that that is a, a much better way to go. And one of the, the, the big issues that, uh, that we have is uh, uh, what is the database for determining what was the cause of the, freight, uh, of the uh, Amtrak uh, delay? Uh, right now, it uh, depends upon conductor daily reports. The conductor is back with the passengers punching tickets. It is hard for he or she to know exactly one to stop speaking. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hamburger. <laughs> Mr. Cummings. Mr. Solman, um, you referenced several safety features and procedures in your testimony that were once under fire because of costs and political considerations. Uh, now that we are living under sequestration, are there any policies or safety measures that uh, you feel are particularly in risk in this environment of uh, indiscriminate cost cutting? Um, off the top of my head, uh, nothing in particular, but I would like to comment, everybody has been speaking about PTC. I have a lot of heartburn with PTC being pushed back three, mo three more years after a seven-year process from 08 to present uh, not to implement PTC, and now they want to go into a 10-year, you know, an additional three, three years, when we all know that the National Transportation Safety Board recommended PTC to be implemented as early as the, as the uh, late 70s. I mean, come on, we knew this was coming. We need to respond in a more practical manner to address the safety issues. And this, to push this again beyond, um, I, I, it's very troubling for, for our members to uh, once again uh, not to see this being implemented. And the big, big question that I have, Amtrak, has been solely underfunded for so many years, yet they have had a form of PTC in the Northeast Corridor since 1996. That, uh, I, it behooves me to figure this one out. And the other one is, is why can one Class I railroad implement PTC by the 2015 deadline and the rest of the freight railroads can't? I, and, and where are they in the process? It troubles me, I, I, Congressman. Thank you. thank you for the question. Th thank you. Mr. Sabo, uh, we all know that the American rail industry was once a world leader in innovation and efficiency. Clearly, our claim on that title has been lost as a result of decades of failure to invest in essential rail infrastructure. Uh, in terms of planning for the reauthorization of PREA, what role should the Federal Government play in bringing us back to the forefront of this industry, and what can this committee do to support those goals? If you take a look at our budget proposal, you will see there is a very heavy element in there for research and development. And our goal is to once again make ourselves the world leader in exporting both intellectual property and talent uh, as well as actual rail supply goods. Uh, as we take a look at the role we believe rail has to play in meeting our nation's transportation challenges, we know we need to grow this expertise just to achieve that here at home, 
but again, we want to be a world leader. And Congress, Congressman, if I may, I do want to come back and talk about on-time performance just for a second. Uh, I think it's very important to note that since PREA in 2008 and the statute that required the establishment of those uh, metrics and standards, that on-time performance has improved each year, and this past year was the best that it ever has been. Uh, as an old conductor, I know that the conductor has full knowledge of what is going on with his train. You've got the radio in your ear. You're hearing all transmissions from the dispatcher. You know what's going on out there on that railroad. Uh, certainly, there may be the opportunity to improve data. We think that's an important goal and, in fact, are working with the industry as well as uh, Washington State on a pilot project to do that. Uh, our goal is to make sure that this is not about placing blame but is doing good root cause analysis to understand whatever is causing a particular delay and then coming up with fixes. And the last question, uh, Mr. Sabo, can you comment on the status of the National uh, <coughs> Rail Plan and, and can you specifically address how uncertainty in funding for rail may impede uh, the development of the National Rail Plan? Yeah, we continue to provide a series of rail planning documents uh, kind of working off a list that holistically taking together uh, would generate a, a national rail plan. And I think it's important to note that, you know, it is not one document. It's never going to be one document. It will be, continue to be a series of documents that will continue to evolve as our nation's transportation needs also evolve. Thank you very much. I yield back. <clears throat> Mr. Hanna. Mr. Sable, it's not hard to imagine that you can approve things in 90 days when something, when actually the clock almost never starts ticking because it's so difficult to get to that 90 day point. Um, and it's easy to understand that grants are easier than, than loans that are backed by security. It's easy to give money away. And I'm sure there's plenty of people who will take it. Uh, but as a practical matter, these are private companies that have yeah. arguably supply a public good. And um, in this environment, it's going to be increasingly difficult to justify an out-and-out -out grant, even though it's nice to talk about. And the fact that these companies have to pay such enormous amounts of money relative to their, their, their cash flow and their worth to get to these loans, I mean, you know so much more about this than any of us because you've dealt with it directly. What are those things that cause in the RIF loans not to be used? Uh, why would you expect someone to pay a lot of upfront money for a loan that may never happen? And why not clean up that process um, rather than do anything else first? Because it sounds like, you know, you've got money to give, a, we've got money to loan, but we've made a process that yeah. is a catch-22. So with all due respect, what would you do if you were that bank? Yeah, I think we need to to really do all of the above. As I said before, there are certain short lines that provide important service but are never going to be able to qualify for a loan. And so in those cases where there's clear public benefits, I do believe the grants are important. Uh, the second thing that we can do and we're doing now is to help applicants better understand up front, you know, what's going to be required of them so we can make sure we have that complete application much more quickly and get them through the process that much more quickly. But third, I think as we get into reauthorization, we do have to have a conversation on those things statutorily that we might be able to do to uh, help, in particular, the, uh, the small railroads, the short lines, get through the process. Uh, I know, uh, you know Mr. Malanafi from APTA had some suggestions talking about some of the ways that TIFIA works and you know, perhaps we need to explore some of the approaches in TIFIA and see if it may apply uh, to RIF, particularly if we're talking about small loans. Um, the big boys can get through the process. The class ones can get through. We put Kansas City Southern through on a loan in, in record time. Uh, but they're the ones that, that less need the program. They have uh, other financing options that work for them. Uh, the challenge really is meeting the needs of the, uh, the small class twos and class so, threes. Um, just directly then, is it in any way realistic, this whole RIF program? I mean, is there anything about it that's workable in the real world? 
And is it in any way practical to charge somebody hundreds of thousands of dollars, or potentially, for a loan they may never see? Yeah. There are those that have used the program and used it well and gotten through the process in a timely manner. I'm talking about Class 2s now. Uh, you know, a couple of railroads up in Iowa that have used the, uh, the program uh, several times. And again, have, you know, they understand what the process is, what it takes to get through it, and they've been able to use it successfully. They're happy borrowers, and they, they come back. Uh, so I think part of our goal is to make sure that we can get all the mom and pops to that place so at least if they qualify for a loan, they can expeditiously but get through the what process. What are the credit worthiness standards that you use? Because it sounds like most of these companies are not capable of doing this uh, without this type of long. So isn't that also a catch-22? And what have you seen in, in... It's a challenge, but certainly you expect me, you expect me to make sure that when I make a loan, that there's the statutorily required finding of repayability. And, uh, you know, the last thing I want to do is be the administrator sitting here in front of this committee talking about defaults. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have to balance every day on these loans trying to get capital to the railroads that need them while also protecting the taxpayers of America. So that basically we've established a system of loans that doesn't work to a, a bureaucracy that has a, a responsibility that by meeting it, it almost guarantees that the system fails. Is, that, is it fair to say then that a lot of these smaller railroads are just never going to be viable in the sense that they make they meet these loans, but yet we need to have a bigger conversation about the overall public good of what they do to decide whether or not we're... No, I think the record shows that there are several short-line railroads that can and do, in fact, use this program, use it successfully, and are very, very pleased with the results. Now, certainly there's another pool that have challenges, and so you know, we need to take a look at how we help them with all of those challenges. I believe that there are many more short lines that we can help successfully get through the program in a timely manner, but there are also those that we've identified that are never going to, you know, achieve that, that, that repayability requirement. And so if the service is deemed to have sufficient public benefits, grants are appropriate. Thank you. Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to just shift gears a little bit and address this question to Mr. Hamburger, since you do freight rail, but also, Mr. Lewis, your insight into this, I'm sure, would be valuable. We are hearing a lot about uh, inland ports and how they are opening up opportunities for economic development by bringing all modes of transportation together. I think it worked well in Dallas. Well, I represent Las Vegas, and that seems to me an area that uh, has potential for developing into an inland port. We have the sixth busiest airport in the country, a lot of people in seats coming for tourism, but there's a lot of space to haul other things underneath as well. I-11 has been designated as an interstate highway. We've got to get it funded, but that is moving forward with cooperation from Arizona. So I wonder how you see this development of inland ports fitting in kind of with the future of railroads. What benefits you see might be coming for railroads as well as for communities and what we might be able to do to kind of facilitate that process? Hmm. Congressman, let me take a first stab at that. I think that is one of the things that a, that, a, that a discussion around a national freight policy is going to um, reveal the opportunities um, for, for inland ports and others. Where does it make the most sense to use the infrastructure that we have and that we can enhance in a most cost-effective way so that we are not overly relying on one system, one mode over another? But I think that, that, that provides a dialogue at a national level among all modes to be able to decide where it makes sense and where it doesn't. Because we, don't, you know, we all know how scarce the resources are and are going to be. We need to put it where it makes most sense. And what can we be doing now to move that process forward? Well, I think first um, is, to, is to engage um, all of us with the freight, the national freight um, dialogue. Um, and I think we just had a, a meeting of the, the Secretary's um, committee this week um, to, to kick it off. And I think that's a great opportunity, along with the work that the, that the committee, um, committee does as well, 
So I, I think that's a venue um, to begin this to begin that dialogue. I, I would agree with that, and uh, I'm not sure I understand the, in my own mind the intricacies of that, uh, what an inland port designation means. But if I could expand it to just address, for example, uh, intermodal yards, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that uh, we discussed yesterday in, in, in Mr. Duncan's uh, committee uh, is the uh, length of time it takes to get uh, through the regulatory process, and I think you are aware of. Uh, the uh, eight-year travails of one of our members in trying to get a near dock in or motor yard uh, in Southern California uh, up and running. And uh, it's been eight years, $50 million of uh, legal and environmental uh, uh, studies, uh, and they are now in court for probably another couple of years. And that, it, it, that's a pretty uh, uh, egregious example, but that kind of thing happens around the country as you try to uh, uh, put an inner motor yard uh, so that you can actually uh, take advantage of each mode's uh, strengths. Uh, so that kind of streamlining of regulatory uh, that uh, occurred in MAP 21 uh, we would like to see uh, considered in, uh, in the, the next rail uh, bill as well. Well, we are anticipating the expansion of the Panama Canal, more goods coming in from Asia. The ports in California are getting filled up. They are going to need some place to go kind of as a starting point, and Las Vegas would be well suited for that. Uh, Mr. Sabo, would you? If you go back and take a look at our budget submission, part of what we are talking about there is community mitigation, and it is helping the railroads and the communities have the tools that they need, you know, as freight rail role grows, uh, as we try to cite these uh, intermodal centers, that there are dollars that uh, can be provided, you know, that mitigate the negative impacts, whether it is noise, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, traffic flow, uh, allow for the construction of overpasses, underpasses, and, you know, those things that would just allow the uh, intermodal centers to live in harmony uh, with the community. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Micah. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and a uh, couple of questions. I'll start out with Mr. Sabo. Um, so we write to uh, rewrite PREA. We had uh, some provisions in there for developing high-speed rail that need to be updated. I had opportunity to work uh, in authoring that. Uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is opening competition for passenger rail. Um, do you favor that? I think the key is for, for the public or for the private sector to take a look at investing, there needs to be certainty. Uh, obviously, the private sector is motivated by, by profit motivation, and that's, that's fair. It makes our you economy don't have a problem, though, been around. You don't have a problem with opening. We believe, uh, we believe that there are rail. absolutely opportunities for privatized operations for these projects. High speed. Not necessarily for long distance, or no. I think that's a Why? whole different animal. Uh, well, it's not an animal; it's a dog, and it's costing us lots of money. Our long distance—you uh, you are aware of the increasing losses. Every one of the three major long distance service care routes increased their loss over uh, from the uh, uh, last recorded year uh, to the previous recorded year. You are aware that all of those increased losses, long distance services? I am aware of the fact that Amtrak's financials you, are, are the aware? strongest that they have ever been. Last but year it was the best on record. It has nothing to do with long distance service, and we are still dumping a, million, a billion and a half dollars into it. And through the Disney uh, fantasy land math, uh, they will tell you that they are making money uh, uh, maybe on the northeast corridor. The best uh, returns are on the on the uh, state uh, partnerships. Uh, is that not not correct? And now, in best the fall, returns are on the northeast the fall, corridor. Yeah, northeast uh, the, corridor. Best returns are on the northeast, the northeast corridor. Northeast corridor is followed followed yeah, by state the corridor service. Northeast corridor is a joke in the in the world of international uh, high speed rail service. You're, you're aware of the speed from here to New York City, the average speed of of a seller. I'm aware of how our project is continuing to improve that it's speed dog. and reliability. And then from New York City to Boston, you're aware of the speed? Is it not 68 miles an hour on average? I'm you aware how the, our projects you know continue the to improve the, the speed, speed and reliability is, uh, of service. Uh, even, I think, by our statue, I think we define it around 110 miles an hour. The world is about 120, but most high-speed trains are going 100 
and 40 to 150 miles an hour average speed. Is that correct? Yeah, 186 miles per hour is pretty much the international standard. And I know, so but our good work through the, most through the, the NEC trains future traveling project. In Europe and the trains that are built today in Asia are going 140 miles an hour on average on the major routes. 120 to 140, I'll even give you that. It's 68 miles an hour. We don't even begin to realize the potential of it. So please don't tell me that the Northeast Quarter is a success. Uh, and again, uh, most of the uh, capital money we're dumping into it. The only track that we own, really only substantial track that we own is the Northeast Corridor. Uh, and uh, I, I just got, was made aware of the, your return uh, on uh, non-rail revenue. It's about $100 million a year. Is that right for the Northeast Corridor? The right of way using uh, the return. You're talking about Amtrak's return? Yeah. We'll provide you an answer for the record. Well, I can tell you it's about $100 million. I was told by the private sector that they could get a 10 to 12 times better return if you could give that up. So in our national policy, we should be looking at turning some of that over to the private uh, sector. How many RIF loans have been given so far uh, the last, well, we'll say last year? We'll provide it for the record, Congressman. Uh, half a dozen, a dozen? We'll provide it for the record. How many uh, RIF, the joke was there have been more uh, FRA administrators than there at one point than there were RIF loans. No, that's far from the truth, but uh, uh, there's, I, I'm number 12, like and there's certainly been a lot more RIF loans than that. I think the number's close to 40. RIF, which we tried to do in the transportation bill with the rail section, uh, and that needs to be done. Obviously, uh, Mr. Hamburger, your folks aren't interested so much in that. They just want the government basically out of their business. Uh, uh, as has been uh, uh, my take in talking to your executives, uh, they don't. The big lines don't necessarily n use RIF, uh, and the small lines I heard s you give some grants to because they don't qualify. Uh, I believe KCS is the only class one that I'm aware of that has one RIF loan. One RIF loan. The, yeah. the, the others have not. Uh, well, we need to. Uh, we need to look at that in the future. Are we going to go a second round? I'm ready. Uh, Mr. Zabo, uh, going back to the PTC discussion, uh, Ms. Brown and I uh, have been going back and forth on our discussions on what we feel is a uh, uh, suitable extension or philosophy thereof, but it, you bring up a, a new point on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, certainly, Ms. Brown and I, after traveling the United States, we've been putting together a pretty good idea of some of the challenges with PTC. Right. Uh, I think we'd like the authority to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Is that something FRA would support, giving uh, this this panel the authority to do that on a case-by-case -case basis? This panel, you know, Congressman, I would uh, I would question the wisdom of allowing it to become a political decision. You know, I believe that it is best vested with those safety experts that you know clearly can understand. So the know, administration wouldn't look at issues like this from a political standpoint? Oh, no, absolutely not. This is about understanding the due diligence, you know, the legitimacy of the effort that has been made to date, while also taking a look at those complexities, those, those very real challenges that are out there, working together with that carrier to come up so, with an implementation plan. It's a document that's already out there, so it's just a matter of amending the implementation plans that exist today. And a case-by-case -case basis, FRA would like to uh, have that authority to be able to pick winners and losers out there within freight railroads no. or even with different uh, metro or uh, commuter rails. Yeah. It certainly isn't about winners or losers. It's about ensuring. Well, it it's a, it's a, no, it's about, it's about ensuring about public safety. There are some that are closer to completion than others. That is correct. But those that are closer to completion, if they implement in 2015 or 2016, and others are allowed to do it in 2018 or 2019, there is certainly a competitive advantage or disadvantage depending on what side of the issue you're on. And so if rather than going to a blanket extension 
in a bipartisan way, if we gave that authority to FRA to pick on a case-by-case -case basis, you would then be picking winners and losers, would you not? No, we would be assessing very real facts, and those facts would be... It is a real fact, though, if one freight rail, we we'll use freight as an example, mm -hmm. if one freight rail is able to take the burden of extra cost early, yeah. and every other freight rail is then able to do it with a three-year, four-year, five-year extension, whatever FRA decides is, is uh, fair, I guess, you would be picking winners and losers. We would be assessing the facts, and nobody gets a free, free ride out of this. In fact, what we're talking about is ensuring full accountability and to make sure that that you know, good faith effort is being met and then assessing the legitimacy of the challenges that are out there, and many of them are real, and they're actually somewhat different from property to property. So, and so this really allows us to make sure it's implemented as timely as possible to start achieving those safety benefits for the public as soon as is practical. So if you had a freight rail that was ready to implement quicker than the rest of the industry, would, you, would they reap some type of benefit under your case-by-case -case scenario? Well, they certainly get the safety benefits much more quickly, but then the questions that we would have to be comfortably answered, you know, have answered uh, through the amendment process would be the legitimacy of the effort of the other carriers to date and making sure that it's well documented, it's clearly understood, and that there's no free ride for anybody. The challenge, Congressman, the cha listen, ultimately we execute whatever you, you legislate, but the challenge to a blanket extension is are we going to be sitting here three years from now facing the same challenge that the people feel that they got a little bit you know, of a breather here, and so the intensity of the effort lets up. That's the risk. And so there's a lot to balance here. If FRA was put in charge of, of PTC, what would happen on the other side of the spectrum for uh, some of the commuter rails that would not be prepared to enter into something like this. We were just in Chicago, for example. Now, Chicago uh, is having its own challenges financially with furloughs, and uh, this may not be an area that they are prepared, I'm not trying to mm -hmm. speak for them, but may not be prepared on their highest priority level to fund this huge uh, expense. Do you fund it for them? Do you bail them out? Do you shut them down? What, uh, yeah. what, what would be your future Two outlook things. on a case-by-case -case yeah. basis? Two things. Shame, shame on anybody if it hasn't been their highest priority since the deadline that Congress established has been very, very clear since PREA was established in 2008. And so it's been very, very clear to everybody that the deadline is December 31 of 2018. So if somebody doesn't have the money, if they don't have it yeah. as a priority, if they're looking at their city or county or state in a bankruptcy type issue, do you shut them down? Well, here, first off, if you take a look at our budget submission, we're willing to help fund the cost of PTC implementation for the commuter railroads as well as Amtrak. We believe that there are sufficient public safety benefits to warrant public funding. But obviously, not, not freight rail, obviously, not the private. Not private sector. No, that is correct. That is correct. Obviously, if there is a case where somebody is failing to meet the deadline, we have to do due diligence to determine the facts. And based on those facts, it allows us to determine whether we use uh, discretionary enforcement or whether we have to take an enforcement action. But the facts lead us there. Thank you. This is an important topic I'm going to come back to. I know you've got quite a bit to add to this, Mr. Hamburger, but let me recognize Mr. Micah first for the second round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, let's go back. Uh, Mr. Hamburger, how fast does the uh, average freight train travel in the United States? I heard it was only 20-some miles or something, is it? Uh, the, uh, that is what we have on the website. Uh, the, the way that it's calculated, that includes uh, movements through terminals as well. Yeah, it, but, uh, it does, over, but the, it, over, over the line, uh, the uh, maximum speed on a Class 4 track is 79 miles an hour. Yeah. But the average speed of most freight is pretty slow because it goes through urban corridors. Most of those yard, corridors yeah. were developed at some time ago. One of the smartest things Florida ever did is some rail re relocation. I think the PREA bill should have, well, first of all, to get 
more uh, vehicles and also trucks. Trucks do the most damage to our highways off the road and onto rail. That makes sense for us as an investment. It makes sense for moving uh, heavy commodities, whatever it is, or items. Uh, uh, but the rail re relocation in Florida is the kind of model that we need to do. Get the rail, uh, the freight rail out of the urban quarters. So, Mr. Chairman Denham and others, I think a, a major rail relocation effort is going to be something I'd like to see us push. And that can be done. Uh, it was done so wisely. We're using now that urban corridor. It's going to be converted to passenger primarily. And the speed, I'm told, will double or triple. It will take more uh, trucks off of Interstate 95, Interstate 75, and Interstate 4 in the next 50 years and probably save us money and, again, reshuffle the deck as far as uh, uh, transportation. Has that, anyone talked about that today? Uh, no, sir. You're okay, well, I'm talking about it. I want to see your proposals from your association on how we do that uh, and how that's done. We need to get you out of those urban corridors where it makes sense and reuse those. So that's one thing. Uh, Mr. Sabo's living in another era. Uh, uh, again, uh, staff, where's staff? I, I want to distribute. Come on. Don't, don't take your time. I have a limited amount of time. This, these are the top three um, money-losing routes, well, long-distance routes. They all lost more money uh, year to year. It's getting worse rather than better. And you told me you wouldn't want to put that up for private competition. Is that right? If you take a look at, first off, Congressman, if would, I would may, you, take a look like at our budget proposal. We are, in fact, proposing dollars for rail line relocation. We agree with you that okay. it's an important priority. That's, that's, now, let's talk about the long distance the, we're trains. We're on that. I'm yeah. uh, getting yeah. bad with you. Under, under, our proposal, under our proposal, and by breaking it down into business lines, we believe that through the preparation of five-year plans and our aggressive oh. monitoring of these five-year plans, that long we can distance continue service. to achieve well, you put it up efficiencies for, for the long distance service. Uh, it's getting worse. And I just got news of the chef conclaves that they're holding, uh, preparing gourmet uh, The volunteers? You're talking about the volunteers? They are volunteers, chefs? but they're it's still has cost, and I'm trying to get that. We'll investigate that on my other subcommittee very soon. You'll, you'll see that. But I'm telling you that the losses are getting worse rather than better. Even in addition to the top three long distance, auto train is $122 a passenger loss. And that's increased. That's to my district. That's got to stop. That actually was run as a private sector money-making proposition. I talked to the guy that, uh, uh, that uh, set it up. They had two crashes and liability uh, killed them, and that's when you took it over. But it needs to go back to the private sector. I'd like to see a recommendation for, from you as to how we can help with liability uh, for passenger service. So that, and he shook his head, the record reflect in a positive uh, manner. So here for the record too, Mr. Chairman, I submit all these money losers, including the one to my auto train to my uh, route. Let's go to, um, um, I guess tax credits would be one of the things that could help you the most for investment, Mr. Hamburger and your folks. At one point, uh, as you know, uh, Chairman Micah, we uh, were pushing that uh, very aggressively. Uh, more recently, uh, it appears uh, uh, both uh, in the administration and in Congress that there is a, a desire to broaden the base and lower the rate. Uh, so we uh, have uh, signed on to the uh, c concept of broadening the base and lowering the rate. Uh, we are one of the highest effective taxpaying industries in the country. We do not have. But uh, that would help you. And that, that, you they, can we, believe that, we believe and that, that would be very helpful. You don't need to rely on government programs. Yes, sir. Last, Mr. Tolman. You represent the hard workers, and there are a great many people who are employed in Amtrak and freight rail. It's my understanding that people at Amtrak, um, uh, there are many positions for which they are paid less, their benefits are less than the private sector. You re do you represent both? And is that the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? There's a variety of different uh, wages but there throughout, are, the, uh, throughout the industry. There, the brothers and sisters of, that in passenger rail under Amtrak, I'm told, in many instances are paid uh, less for comparable positions in freight rail. They, in some you, freight railroads, yes, that's yes. absolutely true. That's some, unfair the, it to is them. not true. It's unfair to them, and we privatized 
Uh, we privatized freight rail uh, way back in 70 when we started to do something with Amtrak, and we've left it to a monopoly that's a Soviet-style train operation, and it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's a national joke and disgrace. It costs the taxpayers a, a fortune, which has to stop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back the balance <laughs> of my time. <laughs> Mr. Hamburger, back on PTC. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, first Chair. of all, let me ask you, case-by-case -case basis, uh, do you think the House and Senate ought to just give authority to the FRA on a case-by-case -case basis, seeing as how this uh, Obama administration is not very political in dealing with various items like this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I think the fewer uh, safety mandates Congress gets involved in, the better. Uh, the, uh, uh, our view with respect to the uh, system three-year uh, extension versus a case-by-case -case basis, I think you actually put your finger right on it, and that is to say Chicago. I, it would not be a railroad by railroad basis. It almost would have to be a corridor by corridor, city by city basis. I don't understand how it could be done if, for example, a freight railroad uh, is equipped, but a metro isn't. Uh, one freight railroad is, a short line dealing, uh, working in the Chicago zone is not. It has to be, because of the interoperability, it has to be a blanket extension so that everybody can get there. Uh, let me make two uh, related points. Number one, I do not for a moment uh, impugn the, uh, the, the, uh, the professionalism of, of the FRA. They are dedicated, highly uh, trained professionals interested in safety. At the same time, uh, I, I think this would be an incredible resource uh, demand on them. Uh, I believe, if I'm wrong, Joe, uh, 11 or 12 people in the, in the PTC division. Uh, it would have to be, as I say, uh, uh, each of our railroads will have some PTC up and running, uh, but to, so it would not be a blanket. It would almost have to be corridor by corridor, and I think it would just, just be impossible to do uh, from a practical standpoint. Uh, secondly, uh, I agree uh, with Mr. Tolman's statement uh, that there needs to be transparency, and that's why we presented last Thursday, last Wednesday, to the Senate Commerce Committee uh, the update of our uh, progress report. Uh, I did not attach it to this testimony because we were more focused on PREA, uh, but let me submit that for the record. It details railroad by railroad what each railroad has done in terms of uh, progress in a variety of areas, what still needs to be done. And the last point I would like to make, and I tried to head this off in my opening statement, Mr. Chairman, but I am sick and tired of people saying we need to keep the pedal to the metal. We have to make sure that the railroads don't walk away from this. They are going to be back here in three years uh, you know, asking for more of an extension. We are committed to this. We are not asking for it to be repealed. We are going to get it done. The sooner it gets done, the sooner we can begin to use it, reap the safety benefits, and begin to engage and see whether or not there are business benefits. So we don't need anybody putting their boot on our throat. We are committed to getting it done. Mr. Hamburger, it is my understanding that uh, some of the freight rails are further ahead than others, yes, sir. Uh, as well as uh, some of the commuter lines, some of them are further ahead than others. Um, would, from a freight perspective, would the uh, freight rails uh, be supportive or opposed to doing a, assuming we did some type of extension, whether that is a one-year, two-year, three-year or more extension, um, if this body working with the Senate ag agreed to some type of extension? Would freight rails be able to give a updated timeline yes, sir. on where we were? Yes, sir. I mean, I, uh, that is why we submitted this. Uh, and, and again, I uh, apologize for not putting it uh, on as an attachment to this, but I will be glad to uh, uh, submit it. It is very detailed, uh, getting down to, uh, a, you know, again, the number of uh, locomotives, for example, and the number that... of wayside interface units, railroad by railroad. It does not include APTA. I think, APTA, you did yours last year. I don't know if you have updated it for 13. And would that not also ensure that 
if we had a timeline and you could see transparency. Yes, sir. I'd be glad to be back here was. every six months, every quarter, every year, whatever, however many times you want me here. Uh, to, but that would uh, ensure that talk you about didn't it. need another right. extension beyond That's right. and the two be, or three year, whatever the extension would be. Yeah. Necessary. Uh, Mr. Melanophy, um, in your testimony, you mentioned that there is a critical state of good repair backlog of over $80 billion. Um, PC, the PTC mandate uh, is forcing a choice between critical safety, uh, maintenance projects, and PTC. Could you provide some examples of the choices your members have, are going to have to make or are making today dealing with safety upgrades versus PTC? So, then, Mr. Chairman, as we are aware. As well, um, what type of extension do you think that we ought to see in PTC? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we are aware, uh, our members remain committed to safety at all levels. And while PTC is an important component of the safety infrastructure, it is not the only component of safety infrastructure. We must invest in our, in our rail bed, in our signaling, all the systems that go along with the, making the, the rail system safe. As you may have seen in a recent Wall Street Journal article, SEPTA in Philadelphia had to make a choice in their safety systems and then is going to have to close one of their bridges because they can't afford to replace the bridge and balancing the cost of all the safety systems they have to implement. Those are some of the choices they have to make. We are seeing that across the nation. As they, and with unknown costs for things like spectrum availability and radio system availability and testing, it is going to take some time and some funds to do those. So there are tough choices they have to make each and every day, and that is why we have asked for 80 percent support on the cost of the PTC implementation and free access to the spectrum needed for those public sector entities for the safety component. And APTO's position with respect to extension is that uh, we would support a full three-year extension for the commuter railroads, not uh, in any way letting off on moving forward with railroads that are in a position to move forward more quickly, to implement more quickly. We support that. We continue to support that, and we have supported as our position all the way along. We have railroads that are further along than others. We want to see all of them implemented as quickly as they can, safety systems that enhance the safety and meet the spirit and intent of the law. Let me ask each of you, starting with Mr. Zabo, um, it, we all want to get PTC done. We want to have the safest rail in the world. It is important, but it is also important to get it done right and in the process not only not pick winners and losers, but making sure that regionally, I mean, our job here is making sure we have got a rail system that is the top in the world. We need to make sure we can do that regionally as well. And so one of the things that I would ask each of you is on a timeline, uh, not just specifically to freight or to APTA, but also from a regional perspective, because this is going to be a regional issue. There are certain rails that are ready and certain that aren't. The region doesn't get it done. So, Mr. Zabo, starting with you first, how would we put together a timeline based on a regional ability which would conform not only the commuter rails, but the freight rails? It is part of the reason why we have proposed revisiting each individual impl implementation plan, to be able to take into account those differences that do, in fact, exist from region to region. Uh, I think uh, Ed hit it on the mark that you know, there is going to be different challenges in each re region based on uh, spectrum availability. And that is more of a regional issue, uh, at least for the, uh, for the commuters. But, but uh, FRA is well aware of the spectrum issues and, and the variety of different issues that right. we have by region. Right. Could you put together a timeline? On a region by region basis? Or even uh, the capabilities of each region so that. I mean, certainly, certainly, if I dedicate staff resources to it, we, you know, we can better determine uh, the challenges in each, uh, each given region. Uh, now, what I would question, though, is whether that is, in fact, the best use of my limited resources for my, my PTC team, uh, you know, whether we should, in fact, continue to dedicate those resources towards implementation uh, versus, you know, research and, and writing a report. Can we? Yes. Uh, I am not sure it is the best approach. But, uh, you know, if you want that information, certainly we will attempt to make it available. Mr. Melanophy? We are going to be put in place to have regional discussions. Our members will be more than happy to participate in that process and provide the information available. Mr. Hamburger? 
In fact, I, I've got to give uh, 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 FRA kudos here. We are working with them uh, in trying to uh, change the implementation plan from a railroad by railroad implementation plan, recognizing that so much of the traffic is interlined, recognizing that commuters have to be there, uh, that we're, 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 uh, it, it's, it's still by statute and by regulation uh, a, a railroad implementation plan, but we're working with the FRA to try to put together uh, I don't know when we'll have it for you, but it's, it's, it's the kind of information that I think you are seeking, which is uh, what is the rollout in different uh, areas around the country, uh, will the interchange partners be ready together, and so the, what the, the whole idea is if one railroad is just to pick Cincinnati, uh, Norfolk Southern is uh, going to be lit up in Cincinnati and CSX, their interchange partner, isn't. Gee, it doesn't do us much good, does it? So, you know, there's, there, there needs to be a lot more uh, you know, coordination as this gets rolled out and working with FRA staff, we're trying to uh, figure out how that, uh, how that will proceed. But that is uh, an ongoing basis through the implementation plans, right, Jim? Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll have some uh, uh, taste of that, if you will. Uh, I don't know how detailed that will be, but I think we can get some information back to you in the not too distant future. Uh, we would ask you for that information. In fact, this committee will ask uh, a formal uh, uh, request after this hearing of each of you to, to uh, be able to establish uh, th the greatest uh, need as well as timeline throughout the nation regionally. Mr. Chairman, I would just add from the State's perspective, we would be willing to participate in any way we can to help facilitate the discussion on a State-by-State -state or regional basis as well. Thank you. Mr. Tolman? And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, we too uh, believe that your comments about, about a timeline is, is absolutely necessary in, in order to, if this extension is granted, that's absolutely imperative. Uh, if it wasn't for Congress, I don't think we'd be sitting here even discussing PTC, and I applaud Congress in 08 doing, pushing this forward, and it absolutely needs a timeline, and I would say 60 to 90 days personally. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lewis, uh, could you please give some examples from your members uh, of issues you all have with uh, FRA environmental reviews? And Mr. Mellon, if I'd ask you to follow up after. I, th I think the, from, the, from the, the State's perspective, um, we, we again um, work very closely with FRA and the rest of the USDOT um, modes. Um, I think that one of the, the uh, areas that um, a sister um, it, it mode has implemented and works very well, and we like to see spread across the other modes is the Federal Highways Everyday Counts Initiative. It's a way of getting all agencies together to work on expediting project delivery, um, and I think that there's some lessons to be learned from that from other modes. Um, but I think uh, part of it is a, is a resource issue, I think, within the agency. Um, but um, I think that uh, clearly um, Administrator Zabo is there at the table when he needs to be, and, and um, the willingness is there. I think there is a, there's a resource issue that is um, maybe um, slowing down the process. Mr. Milanifi? Mr. Chairman, I want to tag on some of the things that uh, Secretary Lewis touched on, and, and it has to do with if there was a commonality of DOT rules uh, across all of DOT would make implementations more easy, more easy to adopt. As we look at multimodal facilities, intermodal facilities with multiple modes, multiple funding sources, we run into challenges where there are different regulations from different sub-areas within DOT. If there was a commonality among the rulemaking there, it would make it easier for us to uh, create a common set of CEs and establish a joint FTA, FHW, FRA set of rules for NEPRO approvals. It would certainly uh, simplify and expedite project delivery for all service transportation projects and minimize duplicative and mode-specific requirements. Thank you. I just have one final question. Did you have uh, anything to add, Mr. Zabo? Uh, no, just that, uh, I mean, to summarize, say we're all for it. And, uh, you know, certainly we think that uh, not only there's some good things that have done with the categorical exclusions that we've created over the past year, uh, but, uh, you know, some good things in MAP 21 that can serve a little bit as a pattern uh, but as we get into reauthorization, those things that would expedite project delivery, uh, ensure strong planning on the forefront, uh, we're all for. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zabo, you said something earlier. Uh, we execute what you legislate. What about 208, Section 208 from uh, the last PREA bill? That was uh, 
uh, historical preservation. Yeah, reports uh, completed F and posted on, uh, on the contract internet. contract with a qualified independent entity to develop objective uh, methodologies for Amtrak route decisions. Yep. Um, FRA had requested funding in 2010. We've had four right. budgets. We've requested the funding, and, and, and we've written Congress three times indicating that funding has not been made available. We've got Volpe prepared to move forward. We've been prepared to move forward since 2010. If you would supply the requested funding, we believe that we can generate a document that would provide good value to all of us to make sure we're making market-based decisions as we grow our rail network. So you do want to do the study? Absolutely. And why haven't you requested funding over the last four years? We, we've written Congress three times now indicating that funding has not been available. And it was a formal part of our 2010 budget request. We've since re written and reported to Congress the fact that the funds are not available. We think it's one more tool that can be helpful in doing good planning and ensuring we're making market-based decisions. So you couldn't do it with existing resources? That is correct. But yet you We've took asked it the out resources of the 2011 be provided. budget. I'm sorry? But you took it out of the 2011 budget, the request for funding. We made the request in 10. You didn't fund it. Like I say, we've written three times. We've written, we've written Congress three times indicating that the funding has not been made available. We've got Volpe engaged and ready to go. Provide the money. We'll start on the report. Thank you. I'll follow up with that. I'm not okay. sure I'm getting the response that I'm looking for. Ms. Brown. I, I can tell you that I'm not getting the responses that I'm looking for either <laughs> from my colleagues. Mr. Sable, I mean, and I want all of you to answer this question because we're having a serious debate uh, in Congress about privatizing or contracting out the services of Amtrak. And some people are under the, the illusion that if we privatize it, they're going to run faster. They can't run faster on the existing tracks. Uh, contractual services. So can you respond to that? And I definitely want Mr. Hamburg to respond to it because um, uh, you all have the freight lines and the private owned freight lines. Uh, what, what's your feelings about it? So I would like for everyone to respond to it, starting with you, Mr. Sable. Yeah. The key, whether you're talking about private or the public sector, the key to success is going to be a predictable and sustainable source of funding to make the capital investments that are going to be necessary to ensure that safe, reliable, and efficient service. And without that certainty and that predictability, the private sector will never consider coming in. The private sector requires absolute certainty. If there's, you know, one, one, the private sector is absolutely risk adverse. So, whether we're talking about improving the service through the private sector or through our existing public sector where it's you know, done for the public good, there has to be a dedicated, sustainable source of funding. And, and that's true with uh, uh, rail, but that's also true with aviation. It's also true with highways. Yes, sir. sir. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ms. Brown. Certainly, long-term funding is absolutely critical, no question about that. We also must look at competition. And sometimes we substitute private sector for competition. We need to look at in, in the large basis. And as we talk about uh, how we compete these services, sometimes the private sector and the public sector is better positioned based on the risk availability. And uh, under the enabling legislation, Amtrak enjoys some benefits with respect to uh, identification of its state partners are not available in the private sector. So we ask that you look at all the pieces that enable for a level playing field and how risk is, is balanced for public and private. And there are times that the public sector has also shown that it is able to provide an equal level of service uh, at a good cost if all the pieces are put in place. So we ask that you look at it you know, on, on a competition basis as opposed to just saying just private sector, it's all about balance. Mr. Hamburg. Uh, obviously, there is a role for the private sector, as you so well know in your own state, uh, on board uh, is a totally private uh, passenger uh, service that hopefully will be open uh, in the next year or two from uh, Miami to Orlando. 
with respect to the Amtrak inner city long distance trains, we have a 40 year partnership with them and we support continuing that partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at on board, it is a private, that is it is correct. also working with public and with other stakeholders. Nothing is completely private. Yes, sir, Mr. Lewis. I think um, in response to your, your question, under PREA 209 and the, the progress that has been made to date with the uh, State support on short distance routes, I think that provides an opportunity on specific areas for the States to, to privatize where it makes sense and that the States have to evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. Where is, it, where is the market there? Is there a market available in the private sector? And then when is it most cost effective for them to do so? But I think this is, a, this is an opportunity um, to um, enhance that review. Mr. Talman. Uh, thank you. Uh, there, as we all know, there is no uh, rail passenger system in the world that makes money. And I don't think that's going to change, and I, and I don't see the pri private, um, the return on investment when you have to build a new tunnel through New York City to increase the speed to, or whatever it may be. The government has to stay in, in, the, in the business of rail passenger system. There's no question in my mind that it has to re, uh, stay in there. There are many, many, um, his, there, there's many studies that have been done in Europe of the failures of privatization of rail passenger system that we all could uh, learn from and should have learned from. And I, I just absolutely dis disagree with that. It is not, certainly not the way to go in my eyes. Thank you. Uh, I do want to say that uh, the Senate had just confirmed the new Secretary of Transportation. Uh, so we have a new Secretary uh, of Transportation, and I'm looking forward to working with him. Uh, but um, clearly, if we're going to move forward as far as this committee is concerned, but it, that will mean working together on a very bipartisan basis. And uh, it will not be top down. We need to talk with you all, the stakeholders, and we need to work together to make sure we can move forward together. So I am looking forward to working with the, uh, the chairman. I am uh, excited about the hearings that we have had because we have been getting very uh, important feedback that is very important for members that has not been on this committee like I have for 21 years and understand the nature of what we have had for 21 years but have broken down in the last couple of years because of some leadership problems that we have had on this committee. This committee has always been bipartisan, always, and we have always worked together. I don't care who the chairman was or who the president of the United States was, we have always understand that for every billion dollars that we invested, we generated 44 to 47,000 permanent jobs. And I am hoping that we can continue to move forward. And uh, I want to thank you all for your uh, presentation. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Brown. And thank you to all of our witnesses this morning. Um, as we continue to work in a bipartisan fashion to get this PREA reauthorization bill done, um, these, uh, each of these different uh, hearings has been very insightful and, and helpful. Uh, we will follow up with a number of different questions. Uh, certainly appreciate the discussion about PTC this morning. Uh, and as we have traveled around the nation, we will continue to do that. Um, it has been very obvious to us that the Northeast Corridor has its challenges with uh, uh, some of the safety upgrades and the amount of uh, money that is spent on infrastructure there, as well as uh, most recently in Chicago. We would like to see uh, higher speed rail there, but we have got to fix the uh, challenges with Chicago as well. And then in my home state of California, looking at high speed rail, uh, we certainly need private investors there to, uh, to be able to get that project uh, moving forward uh, and hopefully eventually someday completed. So, uh, we will continue to travel because, as we have seen, whether it is PTC or in improving infrastructure, each region is different. They have their own different challenges. Uh, they have their own different freight issues as well as commuter issues. And uh, it is our job to work in a bipartisan fashion to uh, help to solve some of those uh, issues as we move forward with uh, the pre reauthorization and PTC and, and a number of other issues. So we thank, you, thank uh, you for your uh, responses this morning. We will follow up again with a number of other questions.
At this time, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided the answers to those questions uh, that will be submitted to them in writing and unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I'd like to thank our witnesses again for their testimony and if there are no other members that have anything to add or questions, the committee will stand adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.